First off, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out tonight. I think we have an interesting uh, presentation for you tonight, two of them actually. Um, but I, I would like also first to thank the winner for uh, coming out with the food tonight. And, uh, and uh, this has been sort of a three month period. I wanted to thank you for your patience. <laughs> Um, there, there is a couple of things I'd like to ask before we get started and sort of set some parameters for our discussions tonight. Um, I know how important the budget is. We all know how important the budget is going forward. Unfortunately, I would like to ask all of you tonight that that sort of um, not be part of our discussions tonight because there is still information coming that um, just too early. The budget <coughs> workshop, um, the school track has, in, there will be an announcement going out tonight. The workshop that was scheduled for tomorrow has been postponed until April 18th. That be at Meadow Hill. Um, and hopefully by then some of the unknowns about the budget aid, et cetera, will be known so they can uh, be able to respond to questions uh, a little bit more comprehensively than that. Um, so tonight is really meant for two, two different things. It is, it is really for us to talk a little bit about the, the district's um, planning initiative going forward. I had an opportunity, a number of us had an opportunity to meet with the superintendents, board presidents, and a few weeks back to hear about this, this new planning initiative that possibly could, could look, change the way the compound actually looks um, and uh, maybe help the district in some different ways going forward. Um, and so Mr. Forget will do a presentation on that tonight. Uh, and, and, and then we also have uh, the, uh, the, the Judy Kennedy, the mayor of the city of Newburgh, We'll talk a little bit about some initiatives that she's been uh, doing. Um, but with that said, there's a couple of things I, I would just like to say is that last, the last time we met, and we spoke about sort of massaging the compact a little bit. We're going to continue that stuff. And, and while there's really only one meeting left this year, we're going to have to massage through the summer. So bear with us. I think we have some ideas that I think can, can maybe stimulate and, and encourage some more participation as we go forward. And we'll keep you abreast of that. Um, so with that said, I would like to introduce Dr. Pizzo, our superintendent, for a few Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the committee. Uh, I don't know who did all the cooking, but it's outstanding. Thank you very much. process. 
there are two different strands of comprehensive planning that we're required to do, and again, we want to do in our school district. Uh, they are school-based comprehensive plans and district-based comprehensive plans. When you think about the work of a district and the work of a school, if they're not aligned and going in the same direction, the district office could really make it horrendous in a school for you to achieve your goals. If we don't have an understanding as to what's important for our students in each of our schools and to support the individual unique cultures and climates that were in those schools and the unique capacity of the teaching staff in that building to support those students, we're doing you a disservice by providing you support in a very generic way at the district office. So here we are, we're in the middle of implementing Common Core, we're in the middle of going through the APPR and trying to do all these different things, and we're, we're going as, as fast as we can and, and the best that we possibly can. And we're asking our schools to change their practice, and we're asking teachers to change their practice. Well, you know what? Central office has to do the same thing. We can't function in the, in the model that we used to function in and expect change in practice at the school level. There's got to be an alignment between the two. So we can't function in, in preparing for what we used to want. We've got to change the way we do things at the central office to be more aligned with the new expectations in each of our schools. That being said, we as a school district have some schools that have been determined by the state of New York to not be doing what they expect us to do. So at the 12th school, we have nine schools that are on the accountability list based on the new accountability system that came out over the summer. <coughs> Excuse me. We have three schools that are in good standing as far as the accountability system goes. As a school district, we had the flexibility and, and the, the opportunity to select those schools that we wanted to say, we're going to focus on these schools. So we identified all of our schools as schools that we want to work with and we want to, we want to partner with as a central office in order to improve the education and create consistency across all of our, our schools in the district. We also have a school in our district that's called the Priority School, the highest need school, one of the highest need schools in the state. Happens to be Temple Hill Academy. Um, doesn't mean that the, the staff in Temple Hill Academy has, has issues or the kids have issues. Something's just not connecting in Temple Hill to meet the needs of our students. We've got to figure out what we need to connect in order for that school to get back on track. So the way the state has created the, the opportunity for us to, to identify what's not connecting is through something called a diagnostic tool for school and district effectiveness. And that's a mouthful. So when we think about that, um, the accountability system has uh, um, put us into the situation where there are teams of representatives from the school district that are required to do on-site visitations in the schools with our own staff. The state education department will be doing reviews in two of our schools. They've accomplished one at Newburgh Free Academy, and that particular report should be coming to us soon. Uh, the South Middle School will also be reviewed, and the results of that particular visit, uh, I'm sorry, that will be done next week, and the results of that will come, come forward within the, the next six to eight weeks. <coughs> the components of those particular school-based um, school reviews are based upon six different tenets. They talk about tenant number one, which is district uh, leadership capacity. So what is the district doing? How is the district working to support the schools around different statements of practice? School leader practices and decisions. So when we look within the school, we physically go into the school, and they observe what the administrative team is doing. They observe what types of practices of teacher leadership are in the schools. They look at the curriculum development and the support that's provided. What are the consistencies across the district regarding our curriculum? Our written curriculum, our talk curriculum, and our assessment curriculum. What are teacher practices and how are their decisions being made? What are the students' social and emotional developmental health program? What programs do we have in the district to support students' social and emotional needs? 
How about their health needs? Are we really addressing those? Because if we don't take care of those, we may have some, some issues with trying to teach the child how to read. So where are the connections with that? And the final tenet is family and community engagement. Family and community engagement means what types of partnerships are we setting up and, and providing with our parents and with our community to engage in our schools to support the academic achievement of our students. <clears throat> so that being said, we, are, we have accomplished as a school district reviews in Meadow Hill School, Kidney Avenue, Meadow Hill, Kidney Avenue, and Valescape. Uh, we will be working in Temple Hill tomorrow and on Friday, and the rest of the schools will be done by the end of the, end of the year. The school district visit, and it's a district evaluation, will be, uh, will be done next week. That will um, entail interviews with each of the senior staff members by state education, talking about what are our roles and our responsibilities, and. What are, what's our vision? What are our beliefs? What are our values? Where are the connects? Where are the disconnects? Um, what, did, what is it that Ed does within the district? And is Ed doing the right work? And if he's not doing the right work, how do we get that changed and do? How is the work that Ed's doing connecting with what's going on in human resources, going on in finance, going on in technology? How do, how do these opportunities, how do these different divisions work together and connect? How does, how does the information generated out of the division that I support get to the HR division to inform them on decisions that they need to make? So what are those feedback patterns and what are those loops that we're creating? All of those different things will take place next week through this particular evaluation. They will also review documents. They will go through all of our curriculum documents, all of our professional development documents, all of our action plans a variety of different documents that they'll request or ask for us to produce for them, and they'll review those documents. As a result of that district review, we will get recommendations based on the, the tenets of the district review. Once we get those recommendations back, we as a school district are required to address those recommendations. Here's where I see some strong connections to combat. Because it's a district plan and it represents pre-K through 12, every school in our district, we are required to create a district leadership team. The district leadership team must be representative of the district community. So we need representation from the superintendent's cabinet. We need representation from the Board of Education, principals, other administrative staff within the district, whether they be directors or coordinators. We need students, we need teachers, we need school-related personnel, parents, community <coughs> stakeholders, and higher ed partners to sit down and take a look at these recommendations and say, how can we as a community come together to start to learn how we can work together to improve the education for every kid that's in the school district? How do I listen to what the parents are telling me so that as I make my decision, it's not just made on, based on what's in front of me, it's based on <coughs> representing the entire group and the perspective from that entire group. And it's not functioning from memory, it's creating a plan that is created, it's implemented, and it's monitored for the impact that it could possibly have. The second component to that is, in each of the building plans, there is a component of the district plan embedded into the school plans, so that it, it, it ensures that there's an alignment between <coughs> the action plan for the district and the action plan for each of the schools. Because if each of the schools have to create a school-based leadership team very similar in representation to what you see here. Obviously it would be the school principal, their assistant principal, uh, representation from the grade level teachers, uh, teaching assistants, uh, support staff, uh, parents, community, higher ed, we're trying to bring people into those the schools as well. So you've got a district plan that's moving forward, and you've got individual school plans aligned to that district plan. Sounds really easy, but it's really, really, it's, it's a difficult process, but I think we can pull it off. When you talk about the, the district plan, when we talk about this particular strategic plan, what are the major components that we, we need your input? What are the major components that we need to hear what's important to you in reference to our students, in reference to their success in the school district? Well, that gets into the vision, the mission, the core values, and the beliefs. 
what do we believe? Not what do we believe to get through the rest of this year, what do we believe, where do we want to go, where are our kids going to be over the next three to five years? Where is our school district going to be over the next three to five years? And how do we set that vision, and how do we hear that vision throughout the community? Not just at a meeting, but how do we live up to the expectations that we as a team create for our vision, our mission, and our core values and beliefs? That's how you make decisions for a school district. That's how you make decisions for, for funding and different opportunities like that. You get the community together involved in the design of the plan. It cannot be a central office created plan. It also cannot just sit on the shelf here because it's created. Um, I'm not going to go through it this, this line by line. Um, when, you, when you think about this particular uh, initiative and you think about district strategic planning, how many of you remember the CDEP plans that we used to do? District Education Plan. Uh, hey, listen. Uh, this is this is the same. This is a similar fashion, but what this is is very, it's connected to specific expected outcomes that have been defined for us by the state of New York. So you're going to see an alignment to the accountability system. You're going to see an alignment to the graduation requirements. You're going to see an alignment to <coughs> the grade level expectations. Everything is aligned. It's, 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 it's a really nice process. Um, the, the representatives from the district that have been working with me to conduct the school reviews and, and the specific training that we're receiving, uh, we have Lisa Blonde, we have the principal Lisa Blonde working with us, we have our director of technology, we have an assistant principal from MFA and an assistant principal from Meadow Hill, they're Margaret Chester and Sue Valentino. <coughs> <laughs> so when you think about these particular pieces, and I apologize, I'm just not myself today. Um, when you think about these two, two plans, the school-based plan and the district-based plan, there's a part, there's an opportunity for you to participate in your schools on this leadership team. There's also the opportunity for you to participate in the district. Once this plan is created and we begin to implement it, it must be monitored for implementation. Evidence must be created to say, you said you were going to do community nights and you were going to host um, a, a common core parent initiative for the six shifts in mathematics. Well, did you do it? How many people were there? What did they walk away with? What are the next steps? And those are the conversations we would have on a monthly basis if, as we implement that particular action plan. So this isn't a create the plan, satisfy the state requirement, and put it away. It's create the plan, believe in the plan, communicate the plan, implement the plan, monitor the plan, and connect it. It's got to all be about kids. Everything has to be about the kids where they are, and where we want them to be, and where we want them to work. <coughs> so that, in a very short period of time, is pretty intensive work that we are proposing uh, that there's a possibility to come back and assist us with in the design and development of that plan. Um, any thoughts on that? Any questions? You guys are just being nice, right? <coughs> I'm sorry? It's a new committee? It would, it would have to be a good thing. We, we do not have an existing team like this in the district right now. That I don't know. So theoretically, there would be like a representative who would come back in the school participating in the district? That's, that's what I would like to see. But again, it's not for me to decide that. Um, but I think there needs to be representation from each school, from a parent. Um, and you know, you don't have to do the whole group activities. You can do small group activities, and, and there are a variety of different ways that we can talk this out. The voices are the important piece. Students from from the schools have to participate in different activities. Um, and I kind of want to shift into one thing I forgot to talk about: uh, the surveys. Uh, a lot of you, I can say, I hope a hundred percent of you are aware of the surveys that were distributed um, to our students, our parents, and our teachers. They are truly anonymous. 
I know that some people don't believe they're anonymous, but they really are anonymous surveys. There's no way for us to track that. They're being done by an outside agency, K-12 Insights. Um, that information, we completed all those, well, you completed all those surveys last week. Those reports will be back into our district by the end of next Friday. So we'll have the, um, the profiles of what are the perceptions on the part of the students, what are the perceptions on the part of the teachers, and what are the perceptions on the part of the parents for each of our schools in the district. So we've got some perceptual data around that we will need to inform the direction of some of these plans if we can connect it to some of the, uh, the other findings and recommendations within those plans. We'll have those reports back very shortly. Um, and we'll be doing those surveys on an annual basis to track and monitor the growth and the changes that are occurring. So those of you that did those surveys, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, Mr. Sir. Ignoring me. <laughs> no, I just want to know um, how we're planning as a district to share the information from those surveys. Those surveys come back in a report. It's almost as if they, they take the questions that you were asked, and for the questions you were asked, they tell you the number of people that responded, and they give you the percentages of the response. So it looks just like the survey. So you'll get, in one single report, you'll get the parent questions, the number of responses, the percentage on the Likert scale, and then the same thing for each of them all again. And it's my hope with Mr. Pizzo's backing that we post them on the website so that everyone can see where we're at, so that everyone sees this is our starting point and we need to grow from here.
lived here my entire life. I had no plans on going anywhere else. You know, I often wished that we could take the kids on from entering the high school on a bus and said, let's drive down Broadway. Let's go down Broadway and look. Let's see what you want to do when you graduate. Show them the things that they can do in this community. Take them to the hospital. Show them the hospital and say, you don't have to go to New York City to work in a hospital. We have a lot of jobs here if you apply yourself. But I, I think we have to start to, to move that. And those conversations that we can have to show the value and the benefits of our community to our students in school may give them the aspiration to go finish school, come back and work here instead of going, getting their degree, and staying wherever they want to get their degree. There's so many benefits to that particular process. <clears throat> yes? I love this idea. This <coughs> Once those, once those recommendations come back, I'd like to start it ASAP. Um, I would say it's going to take the state probably six weeks to get us the report back. So, um, you know, Mr. DeServo will get back to me, I'm sure, with, with your, your recommendations and your decisions, and then we can start to plan from there. Um, if it's not going to be through Compact, I have to do it through another, another venue. Um, so um, I'll come up with a different strategy to get that, this same rep representative team. I just see a, a strong alignment to what we already have here. back at it from two years and say, these are all the things that we have to put in place and the timeline will be established from now. That's, that's just my recommendation. But again, once we establish the team, we talk about the way we do this. I can give you the guidelines and, and the parameters and the framework, but we as a team will figure this out.
Could you just reiterate the relationship between the, the reports that are going to be generated, not necessarily from the uh, survey, but from the visits from state and the internal ones? Are those going to develop recommendations or uh, things that have to be implemented or required to be done? So the relationship between that and the committee, is the committee charged somehow with uh, over, overseeing the, that implementation? Let me, let, me take a, let me just see if I understand what you're saying. What if your, I think your question is, once we get the report back from the State Education Department that says you're doing, these are your areas of strength, these are your areas of improvement, and these are the recommendations that you must begin to address. What do we do with that and how does it connect with this team? Yeah, the relationship between those recommendations and the, the, this committee. Those recommendations drive what this plan looks like. Those recommendations we're mandated by the state, based on our funding and the accountability system, to address. So those begin become the beginnings of how are we as a team going to figure out how to address those recommendations. And that's what creates the plan. But it's not limited to only those recommendations. <coughs> yes? Absolutely. Remember when I said each of the schools are being reviewed right now? We have two schools that are being reviewed by the state. The rest are being reviewed by uh, a team that I'm, I'm responsible for uh, coordinating and facilitating. Uh, as we do those reviews, we as the district team have to create that same type of report, Andrew. And we've got to create those, those uh, areas of strength, um, areas of improvement, and recommendations around each of those different tenants. Within each of those tenants, um, it starts with the district office, then the tenant two talks about the school leadership, it talks, the third one talks about curriculum, the fourth one talks about teacher practice, the fifth one is student emotional and health needs, and the last one is family engagement. <coughs> they have statements of practice in each of them. The first statement of practice in every single one of those tenants is the responsibility of the school district. So what's the responsibility of the school district to support each of the schools in each of those counties? So there's the connection between the school plan and the district plan. Yes? If we finance, if this sounds like something, you're going to need some money, I think maybe it depends on these programs. Um, we're going through the budget process now. Is there going to be a line item in the budget to support this? More than likely, um, if there will not be a line item to support this. What this will do is to assist us in strategically targeting the funding to meet the highest needs of the, the programs of, of our improvement areas in the school district. So um, for the local funds that we have, this may help us to inform the way we spend the dollars in a more strategic manner that's based on data. Um, the other thing is, because of the schools that are in the accountability system, we receive federal funding from, from title grants. The recommendations that are provided when we create those school plans, we are required to use the funding that we receive from the federal government to support the implementation of the activities that will address those recommendations. So it's tied into the funding that we get from, from the state and the federal government as well. So you have some flexibility with the federal government funding? Are they being targeted for services? Yeah, and that this is the initiative. So when we can deter, they tell us this is what you have to address. You have to you have to improve the literacy in K two in X Y Z building. Um, that's their recommendation. Get get more of a focus on literacy K two in X Y Z building. Then when we look at the title funds that we're spending, we have to make sure that those title funds are being spent to address K two in that building for literacy. So it, it's really informing us as to the way we spend the dollars, both local and um, title. We okay? Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Porter. We, we will uh, keep this on our agenda from here on out. So starting next month, we will uh, put this on the agenda. We may uh, ask. Uh, to, to come back at other points, but materials uh, we will put on the website for everyone. I appreciate the comments, we all appreciate the comments, and we'll see where this goes. I think there's some opportunities here going forward to help the district. And, and really
Thank you again. Uh, I would like to uh, now introduce uh, our board the president.
And what those basic comprehensive plans have to start looking at is that every child, by the time he reaches the first part of the third grade, can read. And I do mean read. I don't mean pass through. I mean read. So that when they get ready to do math and whatever else, they can do it. I begin to talk with churches and I'm saying, what can you do to help support reading? Everywhere I go, it's like I got this one note and I beat it. <laughs> and I just play this one note until somebody and everybody wants to hear this note. We must, we must, we must teach our little ones to read. Elementary school, our elementary schools are fundamental to the success of what we're trying to do here. You elementary teachers have the palm, have in your palm these little children. These little precious children that are our future that 30% of them are being trained for prison. We're building prisons faster than we're building schools. And by the way, it takes a whole lot more to run a prison than it does a school. We've got to get the message to the state that we want the dollars for prisons in our schools and that we guarantee <coughs> that you won't need those prisons. It's got to be that kind of a trade. We gotta lay, we gotta make, you know, what is this, put our money where our mouth is? We gotta say, our children are coming out of our schools and they are going to read. Unless they're, unless they're completely mentally handicapped to the place where they can't. Then we gotta make sure. If they're dyslexic, if they're this or that. We gotta look at training and, 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 and everything we do and say, instead of why can't it happen, which so many people do. There's only one question. What is that question? What will it take to make it happen? When you're doing your strategic planning, there's only one question. What will it take to have every child read by second grade? I want all of you to go home and ask that question to yourself. I want all of the planning to ask, what will that question be? Because if we're talking about a three, the three-year-old to eight-year-olds, because if we could get to them by the time they're free, we get a better shot, right? So that's that's head start. When when I, I think about my little granddaughter, who by the age of two, the age two, could sit in the corner quietly and entertain herself with her pile of books. Now she didn't get there by herself. Somebody didn't just hand her a pile of books and she sat down and quietly figured that out. No, her mama started reading to her when she was probably first born. She she had little books with, as toys when she was so tiny she you know could hard she didn't know what it was. But she learned the feel of them. Well there's a lot of little children who said can anybody read to them? Can we get grandmas and grandpas matched up with little kids in reading corners everywhere we can find them? In churches? in our nonprofit organizations. Everybody that you know, can you spread that word? Can you put your creative mind behind that and begin to think of, out of the box, how do we get these little ones to read? Because if they can read, if they can all read, then everything else will start popping. Everything else will start. We sometimes start putting the roof on and decorating windows before we've got the foundation built. So I really, really would ask about putting that right at the foundation of what you're doing. And out of that, there's some other words that you use tonight. And they're, they're, they're the, um, I, my, my one note, reading, well it sort of has a couple of other notes that I played with it. And it's called collaboration and teamwork. Collaboration, cooperation, teamwork. That flies in the face of how America seems to be working today. It seems like the idea is to get on this end and on this end and pull as hard as you can against each other and so nobody wins. 
this polarization that we have across America, in case anybody hasn't noticed, isn't working. It isn't working and it isn't going to work. So the sooner we all figure out that, we're all, that there's no such thing as a win-lose operation. There's no such thing as win-lose. If I win today at your expense, you can be darn sure tomorrow you're going to get me. <coughs> there's, you know, these, these arguments that we have between different groups, between management and, and the worker and between the community and all these various factions that all fight each other for something, I just hope all of you notice that nobody's winning out of that deal. So we really have to lay that down and start thinking about collaboration, cooperation, and teamwork. Because that's how we're all going to win. We have win-wins out of the deal. Because there's no such thing as win-lose. It doesn't exist. That's a figment of our imagination. I also would like to talk a minute about focus. And I want to make sure I stay with the clock here now. <laughs> you know, I gotta mind this. I gotta uh, stick with my own rules. I want to talk with you a little bit about focus. I want to share with you. Uh, I'm talking about some ideas here, and you're all about to launch on sort of a review of your system and how your system works. And what is it going to take to make it excellent? Excellent. And I will say to you, from the training I had, some of you may or may not know, I have some training with a, a, a guy named Tony Robbins. And, and Tony has a favorite saying about, in order to move to excellence, it's usually a small shift right at the point of the vortex that takes you in a completely different direction as it vectors out. In other words, look for those areas where you just got to make that little shift. And then focus. When you want to make a difference, it's identify your, make your plan, and all of you working together to make that plan, and here's what we're going to do. The simple little shift that you're going to make to, to get where we want to go, making sure reading's in there. <laughs> right? And then focus. What makes most people not succeed, and most organizations not succeed, is, is that there's, it's so easy to fall off from focus because you've got people trying to distract you everywhere. When you walk the fire, uh, I, I've been a fire walker. The hot coals, you know, the 2,000 degree coals? I have walked those four times. I walked them from here to about where this young lady is, right here. In order to walk on hot coals, there's something you have to do. And I'm going to tell you about three things. And these are the three things that help you get where you're going when you're trying to follow the plan. One of them is, one of them is, Absolute certainty. This is where I'm going. I'm not going over there, and I'm not going over there, but I'm going right there. I'm really strong in my physical self. I know what I'm doing. I, I'm moving with surety because I've made my plan, <coughs> I've got it outlined, and we're going to go here, right? And we're going to stay focused. I have reframed the, the problem. These things called coals, cool moss. They're called cool moss. Are they problems? Whatever problems stand in your way, they're just opportunities to shift. That's all they are. We don't have problems, we have opportunities. Opportunities to see it different and to do it differently and to work differently together. And come together differently. So we, 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 we identify where we're going, we reframe the problem, and we take action. And we move with certainty and we stay focused all the way through to the goal, right? And we get there. 
I will tell you a secret. After I learned this problem, after I learned this, the second time I walked on a fire, I did it as a volunteer, and I had the slightest little doubt that I couldn't do it if I didn't do it the way I did it the first time. And do you know, in one second, I had just the tiniest little red spot on my foot because I had this little tiny bit of doubt about where I was going when I was little. At the minute that it had the split second that I had the doubt, and I took the first step, and I felt the heat the first time, or the, the second time, something in me fired up, and I said, yes, I will. And when I did, I walked. There was, that was the end of that. So I say to you, get clear about your goals. This opportunity is a golden thing that has been laid in front of your lap. It's a wonderful opportunity. Drag your neighbor, drag all your friends, drag your parents, drag everybody into it so that people can really own this plan. So that people can get behind it. So that the next one of these meetings you have, you're going to have to get new chairs out and you're going to have to have standing room only because there's so many people that are really going to take this opportunity to get involved with their schools because they're the foundation of our community. Our elementary schools are something that, you know, they're, the, they're like a piece of the fabric of our community. They're so important for these little ones, for our parents, and I don't think we have been using our schools to our best advantage. They should be places and a, a beehive of activity. I encourage the schools to involve themselves and get the community more involved in them, using the schools as much as possible after school and, and having activities. Have your Boy Scouts, have your Girl Scouts, have your 4-H. Have things going on in your schools so that the kids, little ones, this is their place to be and they feel proud of where they go to school. <clears throat> Do you have questions about what I have said? How many of you think that reading is really a key? How many of you believe that every child could read by second grade, by the end of second grade, that we could turn New Bird around? We could turn New Bird around. Gangs are not there. Gangs are not the problem. Did you know that? Gangs are a symptom of the problem. They only exist because the child is looking for some place to belong. If we keep trying to fight the gang problem, I loved uh, Jim Gagliano, the FBI agent that's worked in the city. He says, we're not going to arrest our way out of this. And he's right. <coughs> we are not going to arrest our way out of this. And so, unless, if we start with our little ones and we start really getting education to them, and by that I mean there's so many pieces of this, reading one of them, but they don't want to join gangs because their emotional, physical, their needs to belong, their needs to feel important, their needs to be um, a part of something will already be met. And it will be met by something that is useful and worthwhile. And they just simply will starve the gangs. That, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We'll starve them from membership. And if we do, they'll disappear on their own accord. So, my goal, starve the gang, teach a child to read. <laughs> right? That's right. And I appreciate being invited here today. I'm willing to talk to any school. I'm willing to talk to any group. I'm willing to deliver a message about this anywhere. So please feel free to contact me if you want. Okay? I think we have our first community volunteer. <laughs>
think that's important that 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 this kind of before the kind of marks my. I think that um, uh, the district is going through a, a significant change, obviously, at this point in time with budgets and, and that sort of This is something I can bring. This is an opportunity for us to sort of massage and re-energize our, our system going forward. Those of you who've been around for a while, you remember is that uh, a number of years ago, in compact for this part, uh, there we would go to these meetings, and there were uh, there were standing room only, right? you know, and uh, there were trainings that really helped us focus a little bit. I think we have an opportunity. We have some challenges here that um, <coughs> can revitalize the system at the same time help the district uh, and and all the children in our district uh, to to move forward. So. Uh, with that said, I'd like to thank all of you for, for coming tonight. Now, uh, May is our next meeting. It's May 2nd. And we, we're we're going to see. Oh, be determined. You better watch out because we may ask you again. Yeah, so, <laughs> uh, so uh, I think what we'll try to do is see if uh, maybe we can get on the website, we'll uh, bring some material here at, at our next meeting uh, to begin some discussions. Uh, to see if we could, uh, you know, focus a little bit about how we uh, see what we're going to look like in the public. Um, but I also think it's important to, to take some of the challenges that the, the mayor gave us tonight. Is to, not, not only about premier. to really take some of the challenges of you know where you want to get to and, uh, and focus on how to get to. I think more often than not, there are so many needs that, that unfortunately we go in all different kinds of directions. And you know, we don't have a, the strength of commitment to one focus. And I think that that's something that, that uh, was really taken from what your comments were tonight. I can know more about that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, but anyway, so uh, at our next meeting, I think we'll keep that as our agenda item. I, I don't know if we should put you on the spot if, if you would be available to be mind coming that night. I don't know if you may not be able to give us an answer to uh, and, and see how we can massage this a little bit. I was intrigued by the tenants. I think the tenants are really powerful tools uh, going forward. Uh, over the last few months, we've had a number of community groups that have not been part of this starting to come, but, but I'm not sh so sure that we've been all that engaging with. And I, that's something I think we need to, to change going forward. There's uh, a lot of religious groups in our community that are, are strong. I mean, we can invite them in. There, there are a number of other entities that are doing some very good work in our communities. Um, and by, and there are colleges in our community really begun to engage. And I think that, that there are a number of social entities. So let's challenge ourselves and we can begin talking about that uh, at our, our next meeting. Uh, I want to remind you all who are here tonight, if you didn't mind signing the attendance sheet going forward. And I, I'd like to comment that the mayor made is that the next meeting, bring some friends. Bring some, bring your neighbor, bring somebody else who uh, uh, you, you would like to see get engaged. Um, and, and we may need through this up to try to, to move this a little bit more uh, aggressively. So, okay, so our next meeting, May 2nd, you'll find out where that will be in Dr. Murray.